with the linked list class itself. Um, and here is something that's going to be really important today. So when we were simply using the linked list class, we were only concerned with the fact that we could like add elements to the list and remove elements from the list and iterate over the list. Um, we were just concerned with the elements in the list, basically the values we were storing in the linked list. A challenge that we have now is that we need to, since we're implementing the linked list, there is some internal data structure that we have to keep track of. Um, and so we're going to create that now. And we're going to have to try to keep it separate conceptually in our head from the data that the user specifies, the elements. So here's what this extra data structure looks like. Um, so let's scroll down to like line 55 where it says class node. We're going to create a, an inner class. Um, and you may remember inner classes from um, when we were doing like listeners. We would create inner classes. Um, and we did that so that the listener could access the private instance variables um, of the containing class that was like doing our GUI and stuff. We're going to create an, an inner class here for similar reasons in that we want to, basically two reasons. Yes, this class needs to access the private instance variables of our linked list class. But also, this is a great example of encapsulation. No other class anywhere needs to be aware that this node class even exists. The purpose of this class is solely for use within this linked list class. And nowhere in the public interface are we ever going to refer to a node. Okay? So this is actually a really good design in terms of keeping this thing encapsulated within the linked list class. So we're just going to say, oops, um, we're going to create the class. We're going to say static class node. And because this is only to be used within the linked list class, we're not going to, we don't need to make the node class itself abstract or have encapsulation. We're simply going to have public instance variables. And one is going to be of type object, and we're going to call it data. And the other is going to be a reference to a node, and we're going to call it next. And that's the entirety of this class. This class has no constructors, um, which means by default, there'll be a default constructor that will initialize data to null and next to null, and that's just fine with us. There's no mutator methods, no accessor methods, no set and gets. Because these are public, within the linked list class, we can just directly access .data and .next, um, which is just fine, because we're only using it within this class. So what we need to keep straight in our head is the difference between a node in a linked list, which is the actual object that the linked list is built from. One node literally references the next node, which references the next node. Um, and the elements that the user adds to our list, that's what gets stored in this data instance variable here. We're doing several things today to simplify this example we're doing. So we're doing a singly linked list, not a doubly linked list. Um, meaning, if it was doubly, we would need to keep track of the previous node as well. Um, and that's a useful, and like the Java standard library linked list does that. Um, but it's additional complexity I don't want to muddy the waters with, so we're only going to do a singly linked list. In addition, we're writing our linked list um, kind of like the way it existed in early versions of Java before we had generics. So we're not going to define this as a generic. We're not going to have a linked list of strings or turtles or rectangles. We're just going to have a linked list and the, the type of all of the elements is just going to be a capital O object. Okay. Um, this is how Java actually used to work before there were generics. So, and again, we're doing that not because it's a good idea, yeah, but because it just simplifies things so we can really focus on the structure of the linked list and not get distracted by generics. After we have practice with this, when we get to the summative lab at the end of this chapter, you're going to create a, uh, a stack and a queue 
and you're going to make those actual generics like you would in a modern Java library. Um, but that will be fine then because you will have already done this and you'll understand this and we'll be in good shape to do that. So we're definitely keeping something simple. Um, I need to do more research in terms of the use of the static word here, saying this is static class node. Um, I'll get back to you tomorrow on that. I know that we put static here because when we come, otherwise when we start compiling this, we end up with multiple class files of the inner node class, which is inefficient, and we don't want that. Um, and static basically says, we're not, we don't need that, we don't need those features. We only want one class definition for node, we don't need multiple definitions. That's not a complete answer, and so I'll have a better answer tomorrow. Um, in case you're wondering, like, what does static mean for a class? That's a great question. So. So this little class here is really at the heart of our linked list. Now that we've defined this class node, we can use it in our linked list class. So now let's scroll back up to the top here. And we need an instance variable. So we're gonna have an instance variable. It's going to be private. We do want good encapsulation for our linked list class. So it's going to be private. It's going to be of type node. And we're going to call it first. And let's document what this means. First refers to the first node in this list. If the list is empty, first is null. First is the only instance variable in our linked list class. It's all we need, which is kind of cool. So a linked list object is really nothing more from a data perspective than a reference to the first node in the list. That's it. And if first is null, then we know the list is empty. And if first isn't null, then we know it refers to the first node. And we're off and running. That's all it takes to have a singly linked list. If we had a doubly linked list, we'd also need to keep track of the last node in the list. But we're not gonna, we're gonna keep things simple here. Cool. So, um, just to be explicit, let's write a default constructor. So throughout this, this file, I've left all the Java doc comments in just to save us time. And we're just gonna write the code. So this constructs an empty linked list refers to the default constructor. So we'll just say public linked list. And even though like the default constructor provided by Java would be fine, let's be explicit and just say this dot first equals null. Um, as a nice reminder that if first is null, the list is empty. That's an important concept for us to keep in mind. Cool, so when we make a new linked list, it starts off empty, just like the linked list class um, in the Java standard library. All right, so let's implement this method. This method returns the first element in the linked list. You re may remember, I hope you remember, that the name of that method in the Java standard library is get first. Ours is gonna be the same. The return type is of type object, and the method is called get first. This is where it's important to make sure we keep straight the user's data from the nodes, okay? No method here, including get first, can return a reference to a node because node can't exist outside of this class, okay? um, So when we call get first, the user who calls get first doesn't care that we have nodes. They just want the data that's stored in the first node. That's all they want, and so that's what we're going to return. And, and it's actually pretty easy to do because we can just say return this.first is a reference to the first node. And the first node has an instance variable data. 
which will refer to the user's data. So that's all we have to return. Now it's not quite this simple because we have to deal with the fact that users don't always call the methods when they should. And if you call the get first method and the list is empty, we, this would generate a null pointer exception right here because we're trying to dereference first, but first has a value of null. We're going to mirror the behavior of the Java standard library linked list class, meaning if someone calls get first on an empty list, we're going to actually throw an exception. We've all indirectly generated many exceptions, like array index out of bounds exceptions and stuff like that. And we've seen them show up in the terminal. Um, you may have written some code to catch exceptions and deal with them, um, but you probably haven't yet written code that actually throws a new exception. Um, it's pretty easy to do, so let's, let's write that together. Let's check first for the condition. If this.first is equal to null, we know the list is empty. And if the list is empty, we're going to throw a new no such element exception. So there is a Java reserved word called throw. And the, the metaphor that's used for exceptions is that you throw an exception and someone can catch it. So catch is another Java reserved word. What comes after throw is simply a reference to an exception object. There is an exception class, and there are many, many subclasses of exception, multiple like layers of subclasses. Um, we're going to throw the exact same exception objects that the linked list class already throws in the Java standard library. So we're going to use the no such element exception. When, just something I want to be clear about is when an exception is thrown, this get first method never actually returns. This line of code never executes. Exceptions break our normal flow of program execution. And so the next line of code that runs after this throw statement is, in terms of our call stack, it's like, the innermost try catch block that exists somewhere in the call stack. Okay, So if you want to catch an exception, you say try, and you have some curly brackets, and you're going to try this stuff in the curly brackets. If bad things happen and exceptions are thrown, you have a catch after it, where that code runs. The innermost version of that, that catches this type of exception, is the very next code that would run. Nothing between here and there. No more return statements, no nothing. That's just the next line that's executed. If there is no try catch block somewhere, the Java runtime will catch this exception. Our program will crash. It will print out a message on the terminals that we're used to seeing. Okay. So the lesson to the user here is don't call get first if there's nothing in the list. You better check first. Okay. All right, so that's what get first looks like. We're going to skip over remove because I think it's easier to think about add first. So let's write that. Well, let's write the method header and then let's look at a picture. So public void add first is another method on a linked list from chapter 15. And it takes a single parameter, which is a reference to some element that we're going to add to the list. And again, since we're not doing generics here, we're just going to say it's a reference to something of type capital O object because all classes um, inherit from capital O object. Oops. So here's a diagram showing what it's like to insert a node. We looked at similar diagrams in chapter 15, and they were a lot simpler because they were just conceptual diagrams. We didn't have to worry about the actual data structures involved in a linked list. Now we have something a little bit more sophisticated. This red box represents the linked list object, and it's one and only instance variable first, which is currently referencing this node here. All, both of these red boxes represent node objects. 
So they have the data instance variable and the next instance variable. The data for this node here is Diana. So if we were to write code and we were to say add first and pass in the string Amy, we would have to do three things to add that element to our linked list. We'd first have to make a new node object, which is shown here. And we'd have to initialize data to be the element, which is Amy. So first we're gonna make a new node, we're gonna initialize data. Then we have to get this new node linked properly in the list. And the order in which we do this is really important. What we're first gonna do is we're gonna update the new node's next instance variable to refer to the node that currently is the first node in the linked list. And the way we find the reference to this node is because it's the reference stored in the linked list's first instance variable. Once we get the new node hooked to the current first node, then we can change the value of first in the linked list object to refer to that new node. If we were to swap steps two and three, we'd lose the reference to the original first node and we wouldn't be able to keep our list linked up right. So the order in which we do things is like really, really important when we're dealing with nodes in a linked list. So this is what it looks like in terms of a picture. The code is surprisingly simple, like misleadingly so. Um, but here, let's see what it looks like. So add first. Step one, we need to make a new node. So let's create a local variable literally called new node and then say new node. Let's initialize its data. So new node.data equals element. Take the user's data, the user's element that they're asking us to add to the beginning of the list, store it in new node with the data instance variable. Please excuse this interruption. Can we please release sophomores, the last name starting with the letters R O B through Z? Those students, please go to the unpack at this time. Again, sophomores, please release them. The last name starting with the letters R O B to Z. Please head to the unpack. The second step in the picture. So we just did the first step. The second step was to set next to the what is the first nodes in the list. And that is as simple as this, new node dot next equals this dot first. Take the value of, the, of this linked list's first instance variable and store it in the new node's next instance variable. Sweet. And then the third step is, okay, well now this new node is gonna be the first node in our linked list. This.first equals new node. Oops. That's it. Yeah. So this.first is just a reference to the fourth node in the This that first here. Yeah. So this refers to the linked list object. And the linked list object reference, it's not a node, it's a linked list. It has an instance variable whose value is a reference to a node, which is the first node. So that's what add first looks like. If the list was empty, in my example, it wasn't that I showed you with the picture, but if it was empty, this code would also work just fine. Um, it's just that we this.first would have a value of null here, so we, we'd assign null to new node.next. That's fine, it just means it's the last node in the list. And then we, we would update things accordingly. So if the, node, if the linked list is empty, this code works without changes.
let's see what it's like to remove a node. So let's write just the method header, and then we're going to look at a picture. Public object remove first. So here we're removing a node. In some ways, this, like from a diagram perspective, this looks even simpler. I think from the code perspective, though, it's, it's a little bit more complicated. Um, but here's the current state of our linked list. Here's the linked list object. It's instance variable first. The value of first is a reference to the first node in the list whose data is Amy. That node's next refers to the next node in the list whose data is Diana, and so on and so forth. If we say remove first, that means we're going to get rid of this node from our list and we're going to return its data to the user. To do that, it's as simple as this like little dashed blue line. It makes it look so easy in the diagram. We're just going to change the value of first in the linked list object to refer to the second node in the list. The way we get the reference to the second node of the list is we look, we follow the reference to the first node in the list and then we follow its next reference to the second node in the list. Um, that's how we find our way to this. And the code looks, again, like deceptively simple. So we can say, first we need to grab hold of the um, element so we don't lose it. And that would just be this.first.data. So copy a reference to the first node's data because we're going to eventually return that to the user. The first node in our linked list is going to be reassigned to be the second node in the linked list. This line of code has only five words and three dots and an equal sign, but I think conceptually there's a lot going on there, right? Um, the right side of this expression we're basically starting with the linked list object. We're getting a reference to the first node. We're getting a reference to the next node after the first node. And that's what we assign and overwrite and change the value of the first instance variable. So that's what that looks like. Let's write a few lines of code together, and then we can look at this in the debugger, and I think that's going to help us visualize it and also um, give us a context to ask some questions. So open up the list demo class, and let's actually create um, a linked list. And we're going to use like the same characters that we used from chapter 15. So we're going to create a linked list and add names to it. So like we did in chapter 15, we'll create a variable named staff. It will refer to a linked list, new linked list. And then let's add a bunch, we'll call add first a bunch of times. Let's add Tom, you may remember Tom. And we'll add Romeo. And we'll add Harry. And we'll add Diana. Cool. So when all is said and done, we should have a linked list with four elements, and therefore four nodes. And since Diana was added as the last call, Diana should be at the beginning of the list, followed by Harry, Romeo, and Tom.
I'm going to actually hit debug here so I can show you in the debugger what this looks like. I'm going to say proceed because some files I should have made compile better, but these at least compile. I can look over here in my local variables and see staff and see that it's a linked list. I just made a new one. So first is null. That's how we know it's empty. If I step into the code to add Tom, we can see that we make a new node object here. And we initialize element to Tom. So now data shows up as Tom. We initialize next to this.first. First is null because the list is currently empty. So next is going to stay null. That means it's the last node in the list. And now we're going to update first to refer to the new node. And sure enough, if I step over this, first now is no longer null. And it refers to the node whose data is Tom. Cool. And if I just step over the code for adding Romeo, I can see that first now refers to Romeo. And the node that has data of Romeo, its next refers to a node whose data is Tom. And so literally in the debugger, if I step over Harry and I step over Diana, we can actually see the whole linked list by just looking at the variable in the debugger. The first node has data Diana, the next node has data Harry, the next node has data Romeo, and the next node has data Tom, and Tom's at the end of the list because next is null. Okay. That's how a linked list looks like in a debugger.